All right. Next up, we have Ben Christ. Uh, like I said, Ben is a student at the, uh, in reproduction physiology there at the University of Kentucky. Uh, and he's also been working for a number of years as the research associate for the uh, extension associate for the extension group at, at Kentucky. And I'll tell any of you guys that are associated with academics or any, you need a good repro guy, whatever that means, I don't know what it means, Ben. But uh, he's your guy. He's a good practical uh, thinker, and uh, we're certainly glad to have him. And I'm going to hate to lose him here in a little bit, but uh, but I would say he probably wants a better paying job than what we're offering right now. So uh, Ben's going to talk about the uh, milk, both the benefits and the burden associated with that. And uh, so Ben, it's all yours. Dr. Bullock, thank you for that introduction and, and for the opportunity to present BIF. Certainly, is a humbling experience to be here today to present uh, some of our, our research projects and for this opportunity to be here with uh, this line of speakers is, is honestly quite humbling. Excuse me. So, the topic of our talk today is milk and benefit or burden. So, before I really get into and start looking at, at simply milk and talking about milk, I wanted to step back and look at the genetic trends and specifically in the NH breed over really the last uh, almost 50 years. So if we look at the, the light blue line here and that highlights the weaning weight direct PPD. And from, from 1972 to 2020, we're from almost negative 20 to now on a breed average, uh, current sires is right over a uh, plus 60. So a huge change in weaning weight, right? From these past 50 years, there's been huge genetic progress in that, in that weaning weight, to be in those weaning weights of those calves. So what might be really causing that? So if we look at the milk EPD now here in this, in this red line, and from 1972 with a breed average was a plus nine, to now in 2020, the breed average was a positive 26. So when it uh, was a plus 17 uh, there in the change, but we saw that huge increase or that huge change in the meaning weight direct EPD during that same time period. So what else might be going on? Well, then if we started and we started to switch years here and look at the cap. So this is looking at the mature weight in the, in the gray line that's, that's increasing dramatically, right, from a negative 90 on an average to just over 60. But at that same time, Dr. Bull, we saw the mature high EPD here, this orange line was staying relatively flat during the same time period. So we had mature height staying the same, but mature weight increasing dramatically. So it's not that we were just simply getting bigger cows, we were keeping cows, they're around the same height, but, but certainly at a much larger body weight. So if we look at the milk EPD, and to really define what the milk EPD is, and to get uh, uh, maybe think about it a little bit more appropriately. So it, we commonly just refer to it as, as milk or milk EPD. And this is a definition straight from the Angus Association website. But it's the predictor of a sire's genetic merit for milk and mothering ability, but it's expressed in his daughters compared to daughters of other sires. But and really what that is measuring is, is the, not the pounds of milk that that, cat, that cow is producing, but those pounds to, the, to his granddaughters, right? Or those calves out of his daughters in their weaning way. So really, it's commonly referred to as simply milk, uh, but it's actually measuring maternal weaning weight. And throughout this presentation, uh, it, it will be referred to as both and flip-flop. Between both uh, in the presentation, and I may likely slip up, Dr. Bullock, and, and call, call them uh, uh, either one or the other, but really what it's measuring here is the maternal weaning weight and not just the milk production of that cow. So what's another way to look at it? To maybe try to get a better grasp on what is the milk EPD. So we have sire A with a milk EPD of plus 40 and sire B with a milk EPD of plus 30. So we take these two sires and we bring them to a group of, uh, or to the same, to a group of cows, right? So then we have offspring up top out of sire A and we have offspring out of sire B. And then those cows have calves. And now we're left with these two calves over on the right hand side, A and B. And because that sire A's milk EPD was 10 po points higher than sire B, we would expect on average, if we kept everything else constant, that those calves that go back to sire A would be 10 pounds heavier at wean. And that's due to the, uh, the milk and maternal ability of, sire, of the sire A and sire B's uh, uh, daughters. So to look at an increase in milk production, okay, and this is milk production at peak. At peak lactation. 
and then comparing that in relation to calf weaning weight. Now these are both in kilograms, but if we think about them in pounds and what this graph is really showing in this trend line, that for every one pound increase of milk at peak production equates to seven additional pounds at weaning, right? So that's pounds of, of milk, and that would be fluid milk in this case, uh, would it, would seven pounds of additional milk would equate to an additional pound of, of calf weaning weight. So we know that if we in, that increased milk production increases weaning weight. But that milk, that extra milk has a cost, right? And it was talked about earlier this morning uh, and they were talking, Dr. Phelan mentioned that as those, those pig weights increase and at weaning, they also knew that they were getting more milk, but there's an extra cost associated or there's a cost associated with that extra milk. So if we work backwards and try to capture the added pounds of those cows and we need to figure out to determine how many pounds of milk does it take to produce that extra pound of calf? And to do that, then we can look at, well, how many more pounds of feed does this cow need to assume, consume? And that extra feed has a price. So it's working backwards to figure out what is that extra cost? What is that feed cost for that extra pound of calf? Dr. Lawman has done some really good work and has actually presented on this at BIF uh, several years ago and, and at the Applied Reproductive Meeting uh, in 2019. And this is from one of those proceedings. And he looked, took several studies, and those uh, numbers ranged from 12 to 71 pounds of milk for an additional pound of calf weaning weight. But on average, it took 42 pounds of milk for an additional pound of calf weaning weight. And when I put this together, that number, uh, it really surprised me that that number was so high. But that's pounds of fluid milk. So if you think about what is the, uh, you know, the percentage of water that the milk is, and it's 88%. So that comes out to be five pounds of dry matter for that additional pound of, of uh, calf. So then we can work back a little bit more and figure out how much energy is required uh, to produce that pound of milk. So if we just take some, uh, the NASM or the NRC values, and it's 0.33 megacals per pound. So then we can take our 42 pounds of additional milk, divide that by 0.33, and that's almost 14 megacals that's needed to produce that pound of milk or pound of calf. I just uh, use corn for this example. And if we do the, the, the math here, you can see that the, the amount of corn uh, for, on a dry matter basis that's needed to support lactation and using just the current price for corn now uh, from last week came out to be $1.85. So it was $1.85 for, for that corn there to produce the 42 pounds of fluid milk to produce the uh, one additional pound of calf. So then we have to take into account, well, how much is that extra pound of calf worth, right? So we can look at it from an efficiency standpoint to lower the number of pounds of feed that are required to produce that additional pound of milk. And then also look at it from an efficiency standpoint of lowering the pounds of milk that are required to produce that, that extra pound of calf. So the need for revisiting milk and the milk EPD and the relationship of the milk EPD and the, those sires' daughters uh, and their milk production was characterized in the late 80s and the early 90s. But remember that genetic trend for milk from 1972 to 2020, it went from a plus nine to a plus 26 on root average. So there's a significant increase for that genetic trend. And we talked about that, that additional cost for that pound of feed to produce that milk, to produce that extra uh, pound of calf. So from an energetic standpoint, we need to understand what is the energetic cost to produce uh, that, that additional milk, to produce additional calf. I really like this quote, I, I borrowed this from Dr. Lenfuller uh, on one of his presentations in the UK, and that insufficient data are currently available to fully characterize the effects of age and breed of cow, stage of lactation, nutritional status on the milk composition in these cows. So this leads us into a research project that we've been working on at the University of Kentucky, along with Dr. Greiner at Virginia Tech and Dr. Carmen at North Carolina State. But really to determine the level of milk production of cows uh, that are sired by bulls with known milk EPDs. The objectives of this study, uh, there were several here, but to determine the association of milk EPD and the total maternal index with daughter's milk production of current genetics. Also to calculate what is the appropriate economic factor of milking ability in, in those selection indices. And to evaluate and to compare the milk components of current genetics with the, the, the values that are currently being used and recommended by the, the NASA. And then finally, to investigate the relationship of the milk EPD 
and total maternal index with the adjusted 205 day uh, weaning weights. Just a little on the project design again, it was across multiple uh, university research firms. Uh, this was a two year uh, project so far. And data was collected at three time intervals during lactation. So on average of, of these, uh, the age of these calves, uh, and some herds, they were split into groups just based on the distribution of calving dates to keep a little bit more of a, a uniformity. But they were collected at 45, 90, and 135 days into lactation on uh, average. And uh, this, I really probably should have put our, my last bullet point here closer to the top, uh, but this, this project wasn't really a structured uh, design uh, experiment, uh, but rather more or less uh, was a field project. A field study and using data uh, in cows that were already in uh, the university herds that had existing breeding decisions uh, and using those cows and their values on, on the rather than uh, having a design uh, experiment where we would use fewer sires and be able to control the number of sires used that would take several years until uh, those calves would be born and then those cows would be in the production uh, to track that so we use what we have rather than setting up a design experiment. So because of that, we had a lot of variation in sires. And there's actually 75 sires represented uh, in the data set that we'll talk about here in just a little bit. Uh, and three breeds were represented, but about 80% of those sires were, were in the sires, and then the remainder being Herford and Senegal. But all the PPDs that we'll talk about here today uh, were adjusted to an any space that we were staying on the same level. We did collect EPDs and they are, they are current and what we're presenting here today uh, as of June 1st. So for the project and to get an estimation on the 24 hour uh, milk production or how much milk in pounds is that cow producing in a day, uh, we used a waste up away protocol. So in the morning the, the cows and calves were gathered, they were sorted off for, for a four hour period. And during the four hour period, it allowed us to collect the data on, on cows. So we were capturing uh, body weights, body condition score, uh, and also milk samples as well during this time. Then right, right around lunchtime, we would put those uh, pairs back together, allow those calves to, to suckle their cow, uh, uh, the cows for 45 minutes. And that's really to establish uh, that baseline on those, on those pairs. Then they went through a six hour separation window and right prior to the six hours, we ran all the baby calves through the chute uh, to capture uh, basically their empty weight. Uh, then the, the calves were allowed to suckle again for another 45 minutes and immediately post suckle uh, those calves were weighed again. So not capturing a full weight. So the difference between the two should be uh, just the, uh, the amount of milk that those calves consume. And that was re repeated in back-to-back in -back days. And, and for these figures that we'll talk about, the value was averaged across those to the two-day period. Uh, the milk samples uh, that I mentioned, they were at, at UK, we collected milk at, three to, at all three time periods, and at Virginia Tech in North Carolina, just at the 90-day period. Uh, but we did inject cows with oxytocin to assist in, in milk letdown uh, to uh, collect the samples that uh, you know the udders were clean. We did strip each quarter. Uh, we tried to collect a representative sample from each quarter into our, our 100 mil tube. All of the samples were analyzed at UK for their components of fat, protein, lactose, total solids, and solids on fat. And, uh, we did use an energy calculation that, that's up here below that includes the percentage of fat on those samples, the percentage of solids, not fat, to calculate uh, the total energy and, and uh, uh, megacals per pound uh, of, of those uh, samples. So to get the total milk energy output, we took that estimated 24 hour milk production, which is the value from the waste up and weight periods averaged together, times the energy component of that, of that sample to get a 24 hour milk energy output value. So a little on, on the adjusted 205 day weaning weight. So rather than just use the actual weaning weights of, of these cans, we did do a several adjustments. So we did adjust for, we put everything on a 205 day basis, but then we also accounted for the age of the dam and the sex of the calf. Uh, we did go one step further, Dr. Bullock, and we did do an average weighted average. So we took into account the, uh, the individual calf's, his, their sire's weaning weight EPD. Uh, so we did go one step further than, than just up here. Uh, just from a time sake today, we won't work through all the math to 
calculate the adjusted to a five-day weaning weight. But you can see that number, that cat's actual weaning weight value is 575 pounds. But when you do the adjustments for the age of the age of the dam and the sex of the calf, and they get that to a 205 days, it's now 672.75 pounds. So the total maternal index, we mentioned it earlier, but we haven't really talked about it. So the total maternal index is predicting the dam's contribution to weaning weight performance of her calves due to her growth and maternal ability. So to calculate the total maternal index is taking the entire milk EPD of, that, of the cow and half of her weaning weight direct EPD. So in our two examples, they have A has a milk EPD of plus 40 and a weaning weight direct EPD of plus 50. So if we work everything out, her total maternal index is a 65. And then if we look just right below that at AMB, with a milk EPD of 25 and a weaning weight direct EPD of 60, that dam B has a total maternal index of 55. So even though dam A has a lower weaning weight direct EPD, she has a higher total maternal index and would contribute an additional 10 pounds at weaning to her calf compared to uh, dam B if everything else is, is kept the same on average. So now to, to get into some preliminary data. And as I mentioned before, we did have 75 sires represented in, in this data set. So as you can imagine, there's quite a bit of variation in those sires in the milk EPD level. And the breed average of her sires in the population in the NH3 now is, is a plus is 26. So that, that's denoted as section one bar over. So the, the one highlighted here is the average of the sires in the group, just to get a sense of what is the distribution? So it's a range of a minus three uh, milk EPD to all the way up to a plus 42. So if we start to look and go into some cow data, really just to get a sense to uh, see the cows that, that we're working with and the variation that exists between herds. So just as we, as, as we look across the row, it's sorted by farm. Um, and then if we look at the age, so the cows at UK on their average age was, was just under six years old, five and a half at Virginia Tech and four and a half at North Carolina. And then as you start to look at their body condition stores and, and those weights, you start to see a little bit more differences that exist between, between these cows, with the cows at UK having the highest body condition stores uh, compared to Virginia Tech and North Carolina. And same, we see a very similar trend there when we start to look at the weights of these cows. So we know starting off that we have variation that exists between these, between these towers that are involved in the study. Uh, just briefly wanted to throw up the distribution of the adjusted 205 day uh, weaning weights of the staff. Again, just to show the, the amount of variation that's taking place uh, in the weaning weights in these herds. So we have a 330 pound difference between the lightest calf and the heaviest calf here, but just to get a sense of uh, the distribution here of these weaning weights. So now to really get to uh, the, the, the main, some main data points here of this project and get back to looking and talking about milk. So this is the estimated 24 hour milk production. So with the waste cycle weight, we had a separation period of six hours. So if we take that, the post weight of the calf and subtract the pre weight of the calf, so the full minus 10 gives us a, a weight difference that should be attributed just to milk. And if we times that value by four, because it's a six hour separation window, or a six-hour period, rather, uh, that gives us a, an estimated 24-hour uh, level of milk production. So, so actually, Dr. Griner beat us here, but the cows in Virginia Tech, on average, their estimated milk production was 15.6, which was uh, statistically higher than that produced at UK, but the same as North Carolina. But I also put up the ranges of the levels of, of estimated milk production here. And this is just at 90 days in lactation. So at all farms, they did have a, a minimum of, of zero pounds. So there was no weight change between uh, a calf there uh, in the waist up away. But those ranges went all the way up to, to 32 pounds. Uh, so quite a bit of variation. We'll see that here in just a little bit in a, in a figure that's just a little easier to see. Then we also looked at those milk components. So taking into account the fat, protein, and solids, non fat, why right? we can calculate what is the energy uh, of, of those milk samples. So the first row are the NRC values or the NASM values of, of what's used in uh, production now to, for their estimations. 
And we were trying to compare uh, the, the current values of, of the current genetics and how do they compare to uh, those the NASM values. So you see there's uh, there tended to be a difference across herbs uh, in their fat percentage of the milk samples, anywhere from uh, just under three to just over three and a half. You see a, a very similar trend for their protein and, and solids, non-fat. When you start to go over and look at the far right on the energy and looking in terms of, of megacals per pound of milk, that the energy output uh, is, is relatively the same and is actually very close to the nascent value of, of 0.33. So if we look at the calculated milk energy output, so this is taking the, the 24 hour estimated milk production and times that by the calculated energy output of those milk samples to get an estimated 24 hour milk energy output. So this, uh, our y-axis here is that energy output in, in megacals per day. And the uh, x-axis really is cal. So each blue dot represented in this figure is an individual cal. And it went anywhere from a zero to 13.1. So we had, we had a pretty big range here just to show this distribution. But on average, the, the 24 hour milk energy output for that milk was 4.3 megacals. And if we look at the entire population, there's just under 300 cows here. But 46% of the cows had an energy output above this average and 54% uh, below that. So it's, it's, it's easier to see on your side than it is online, but this yellow box represents a standard deviation plus or minus the mean. So Dr. Van Balen, when, you, when you're building a feeding program, right, we're really feeding towards the average of that group, right? We're not feeding toward for the highest, uh, energy output, we're not feeding for the lowest, or if you want to think about it in terms of body conditions, but we're feeding for a group average. But even taking a, well, a standard deviation above and below this mean of 4.3, there's still 19% of the cows have an energy output above that range, and 15% are below that range. So we're feeding for a breed average of 4.3 of our milk energy output. So there's 19% of cows that have an energy output higher than that. So those cows would be the cows that are losing body condition source because they're not, they're not consuming enough energy for their energy output that's going out of milk. So they'd be using their metabolic body reserves and be losing body condition source. But on the flip side, we have 15%, but they don't need that much energy, but they're getting it. So those would be the cows that are putting condition on during lactation rather than those 19% that are losing that. To start to look at some correlations, and just a word of warning, uh, these are just the raw correlations uh, between the terms that we'll talk about. Uh, and it does not take into account any confounding effects, uh, but we really wanted to highlight the trends uh, that we're seeing with this statement. So to start off, it's, it's looking at the dam's total maternal value, right? So that's her entire milk EPD and half of her weaning weight EPD direct and comparing that to look at the relationship or the regression with the adjusted 205 day weaning weight. And we did this uh, here just for UK uh, and those cows at Virginia Tech. So I talked about the variation that existed in those, those the range of distribution in those weaning weights. And on that, in that first bar graph, it was pretty difficult to see. But I hope in these scatter plots that it really looks like you took a shotgun and, and shot these graphs rather than a rifle and really following that trend line. So it's a trend that we would uh, expect to see, but if you look at our R squared values, they're incredibly low. So there's a ton of variation that exists uh, in this in this data set in these weaning weights. The next we looked at the maternal weaning weight uh, or the, the milk EPD, right? And its relationship with the average estimated 24 hour milk production at 90 days. And we see again a very similar trend of how much variation exists in that, in that milk output in terms of pounds and relating that back to the maternal weaning weight. So again, it, it's a trend that, that we uh, were expecting, but our R squared values are just too low, just, just due to the amount of variation. By continuing on and comparing the maternal, the dam's maternal weaning weight with the estimated energy output again, uh, not to, to just be a, a broken record, but just to look at the amount of variation that exists here and how low these R squared values are. But it is a trend that, that we would uh, be expecting to see. 
<coughs> so the challenge is moving forward. As you can, uh, can imagine, the progress here will, will be very slow. And there's a ton of impacts uh, that, that go into the milking and maternal ability of those cows uh, and thinking about the level of nutrition uh, between these farms, the levels of management, uh, any environmental factors, uh, the weather and things of that sort. But then also comparing the waste up the weight technique and using a, a milking machine. We start to read through the literature and kind of compare the two, and there's certainly pluses and, and minuses to both. So with the waste up the weight technique that we were using, we're limited by the calf's gut capacity and how much milk it can consume any amount of time that they're given to suckle. Also, the, the scales we were using were at half pound increments. So if we're talking about a difference of, of four, three to four pounds between that waist up away period, a half a pound gets to be a pretty substantial amount. So it could be attributing to some of that variation there as well. And then also the length of, of separation, the length of time that those pairs are separated and not a lot of suckle. We did use a six hour separation period, but some have used eight, some have used 16 and sort those cows at night and let them nurse again the following morning. Or the other option would be to use a milking machine. And Dr. Bullock, I'm glad you chose to do the waste up away instead of a milking machine because it was difficult enough to get a, a, a 50 mils of, out of some cows. And I sure as heck wouldn't want to put a, a milking machine on some of those cows. So then, but it's also looking at the complete utter emptying. So you're not limited by the cast gut capacity. But then you also don't have the presence of the cat that could be affecting that as well. But then the amount of time that would be required to put a milking machine on every cow and run it through, I hope we would not be able to get that done in a four hour period. If we start to look at some, some other impacts, I mean, we saw the variation that existed between herds as far as the average age of those cows, uh, start to look at the sex of those cows. And in the dairy industry, there's a ton of data talking about the incidence of mastitis and its relationship or its influence on milk production. And perhaps with body condition scores, if cows are in excessive body condition, uh, that it's leading to fat deposits and udder. And perhaps even though those cows have the genetic potential for a ton, uh, really high uh, milk output, that she's not able to reach her potential uh, due to excessive fat deposits and udder. Dr. Bullock, I could not pass up the opportunity to include any uh, uh, reproductive data, data here. I think Dr. Anderson would be pretty disappointed if I didn't include that. But just to, to reiterate, from the beginning, it was a dollar eighty-five for the thirteen point five hundred pounds of dry matter of corn to produce the forty-two pounds of fluid milk that resulted in that additional one pound of calf. And I really like this quote from Dr. Mullenix in a review paper last year of the effect of increasing milking potential in beef first is dependent on not only the cost, but availability of high quality feed resources while maintaining the adequate reproductive performance. So we know if we don't provide the added energy that those cows require to produce that added milk, then cows will lose body conditions without showing that figure of those cows above that yellow box. And we know that if cows lose body conditions, so it can lead to a reduced reproductive performance, which leads to more open cows and ultimately lower potential revenue. So if we look just in this, in this bottom graph, and I had to include some repro data, but if body condition score is a three, then the average pregnancy rate in those cows was 43%. But if body condition score was increased now to a body condition score of six, then our pregnancy rates were, were 93%. I think that we really can see this trend as we increase body condition scores, we see that increase in, in pregnancy rates. Uh, I certainly need to acknowledge uh, Dr. Griner and Dr. Harmon for uh, their willingness to participate in this project. Uh, Ms. Kristen Brock at the University of Kentucky that analyzed all of the samples. Uh, and, and certainly uh, the, the star managers and staff uh, that take care of those cow herds and, and allow us and assist us in, in this state of collection. Uh, but with that, Dr. Bullock, I will certainly be happy to entertain any questions. All right, we're just now getting into the break time, but I want to take a, take time for a couple of questions if we have them for Ben. Questions? There we go. Maybe you stated this, but I missed it. The energy content of the milk versus the cow's body condition score. 
Yes, sir. No, I, I, I did not include that, uh, but it is something. This is sort of just a, a quick snapshot uh, of this data and, and, and uh, actually didn't, did not look at that correlation uh, between her, those cow's body condition scores and the energy output, but it certainly uh, would be of interest. We did look at it just in, in weight, uh, but no, no differences there in weight. I need to go in a little bit further and to look at the body condition scores. But great question. Yes. Um, Angus, no PPDs in the country. 18 to 26, something like that. Uh, uh, plus 9 to 26, yes. Is there any way to determine if the cow is actually doing well enough now that we have So that, that, is, that is what we're trying to look at. <laughs> That is exactly what we're 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 trying to look at here to see and, and look at the you know the, the, the current genetics and the current population and uh, and how does that how is that related to her milk EPD. So that's by doing that waste cycle weight technique and trying to get use that method to estimate her milk production rather than put a milking machine on her. So we do we're we're looking at to to see is it is that the case? Do we see that trend with if a cow has a uh, a plus 40 milk EPD, is she, is she, is she milking more? Is that waste up the weight difference higher than a cow that's say a, a plus 11? So that, that's really what we're doing is trying to, try to look at that. Would you like an observation? Yes, sir. <laughs> You're right, I think cows for about 75 years. When I was a young fellow, we couldn't milk out a lot of them. The cat couldn't take it. Mm -hmm. And it, that can continue until we started using milk EPDs. Our curly is probably up from a high average now. Sure. We haven't milked out a cow in five years. That's, that's, that's good. That's not a whole lot of fun when you have to do that. It's usually in the middle of the night and they get 30 out. Okay. All this data was based on fed cow, right? Versus on grass. Uh, the, the cows, I know the cows in the UK were, were out on grass. They did have access to hay. Dr. Grant, is the same case for Virginia Tech? Same thing. Those are, those are fall yeah, so these are fall calving cows, and I probably should have included that. So these are fall calving cows. They were on stock hog So they were on forage. Yes. yes. Okay. So I, I think an important point to make, and then we kind of need to wrap this up, is that um, if, if, if we can get the numbers to kind of look at this and it turns out to be that we don't have that relationship that we were kind of anticipating that, you know, that that maternal weaning weight EPD is drastically increasing the milk. The other side of that is we, we have no clue what like the effect of that cow is in grazing, you know, habits and things like that. Uh, I think that we really, really got to start thinking a little bit more about that being a maternal weaning weight and not just milk. I, I think there's more to it than just the milk, but we got to do a better job of pinpointing what the milk is before we can decisively say that. And, and then trying to find out, you know, what it is impacting it, that's a whole different problem.